When you put a bunch of different men in a clubhouse together on a team, you're going to sometimes run into personalities that butt heads. It's just natural. It doesn't happen all the time, obviously. In fact, most of the time, everyone does get along. They're adults. They should be able to at least tolerate each other. But sometimes things just have to go south. Back in 2013, the Detroit Tigers were really good, winning 93 games and winning their division, finishing the year just a couple games away from a World Series appearance, their second in a row. They of course didn't get to where they wanted, but it was still a year full of success. A year full of success that didn't go by without the lack of some behind the scenes drama though. During that season, Tigers first baseman Prince Fielder filed for divorce from his wife. Now that's an off field issue, what does that have to do with any teammates or or any on the field issues. Well, because it had everything to do with that, actually. Some rumors started to come out that Fielder's own Tiger teammate, Avicel Garcia, had been having an affair with his wife, and when that became known to the clubhouse, things got ugly. But before we get any further, we are so close to 100,000 subscribers on the channel, so if you're new or just haven't subscribed yet, consider doing so. 2012 American League MVP and star Miguel Cabrera took Prince Fielder's side on the matter, and when Fielder and Garcia got into a fight, Cabrera attempted to break it up, only to re-injure a groin that had been bothering him for several months leading up to this incident. Garcia wound up being traded immediately afterward, the Tigers went on to fall just short of the World Series, and that was that. Back in 2016, after White Sox veteran Adam LaRoche retired because the team wouldn't allow his son in the clubhouse anymore, outfielder Adam Eaton attempted to step up as the team leader, something that didn't exactly work, especially for teammate Todd Frazier. Frazier and Eaton were locker mates, meaning the two had lockers right next to each other in the clubhouse, and after Frazier called out Eaton for being a phony, saying that he lacked the qualities of being a leader, this apparently led to a fight between the two where they had to be separated. Literally, they had to be separated in multiple ways, during the fight and post-fight after Eaton's locker was moved across the room from Frazier's. Eaton claimed that he wanted to move lockers the whole time anyway, saying that he wanted to move because the locker being close to the doorway to the dugout tunnel made him too cold. A couple years later in 2018, now with both players on different teams, the beef continued. Eaton's Nationals were visiting Frazier's Mets late in the season, and during a play at second base, Adam Eaton slid hard and injured Met player the Mets were not happy. Pitcher Zach Wheeler ended up hitting Eaton with a pitch, and on his way to first, Eaton started to get chirped by Todd Frazier. After the game, Eaton said this about Frazier, quote, When he usually talks or chirps, usually he says it just loud enough that you can hear him, but you can't understand him, so I'll just leave it at that. End quote. Skip ahead to 2019, and this is when things got pretty out of hand, all things considered. During another game between the Nats and Mets in the third inning, as Adam Eaton was jogging to his dugout, he started to hear it from Frazier yet again. Eaton started to yell back at Frazier, and other Nationals players were ready to defend Eaton before everything was broken up by the umpire. After the game, Eaton did not hold back on Frazier. Gosh, no, what goes on in my mind. Um, but, uh... I don't know, he's chirping all the way across the infield. I don't know, he really, yeah, he must really like me because he wants to get my attention. It seems like every time we come here in town and, and uh, he really cares what I think about him, I guess. I don't know what what, uh, what the deal is. I don't know if he wants to talk to me in person or, or uh, you know, have a visit or what it is. But like I said, he's always yelling across the infield at me. He's, made a, he's making a habit of it. So you got to be a man at some point. And uh, so I turned around and had a few choice words with him and then, it's funny, you know, I was walking towards him and then he, he didn't really want to walk towards me, but as soon as someone held him back, then he was like, all of a sudden was really impatient, like trying to get towards me. So just being Todd Frazier. So what's, what's new? Any reason why with this? No, um, just being himself. So I think that's just, it's about as basic as I can say. He's very childish. Like I said, I'm, I'm walking with my head down. The play's over with, I'm walking away. I hear him a couple of times. Like I said, I'm, I'm a 30 year old man with two kids and uh, got a mortgage and everything. And uh, he wants to loud talk as he's running off the field. Like I said, you know, at the end of the day, I gotta be a man about it. And, uh, and I tried to, you know, stay patient with um, the childishness. Uh, and then, like I said, then, um, you know, like I said, it is what it is. I gotta stand up to it eventually. The next day, Frazier had this to say. I didn't really wanna talk about it, but you know, I heard what he said. It didn't really bother me that much, but at the end of the day, U.S. guys, and when I played with the White Sox in 2016, and I saw 23 of those guys, they know what happened. For him to even talk after that, uh, I don't know how you how you talk after that, and that's basically all I'll say after that. But you know, men usually settle on the field; they don't need to talk about it. But you know, he started, 
with coming at me with that kind of, I'm a man, I got, I got a mortgage, I'm paying two kids. Pay off your mortgage, I don't know what to tell you. Nothing has happened since, other than the two players retiring, but I'm sure the bad blood between them hasn't gone anywhere. Next up, we have the amazing friendship between Barry Bonds and Jeff Kent on the San Francisco Giants. I think you can sense my sarcasm. They despised one another. Kent and Bonds were teammates from 1997 through the 2002 season, and there were some very successful Giants teams throughout those years, including 2002 when they were on the verge of winning the World Series before blowing a 3-2 lead to the Angels. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. So you had some good Giants teams with Kent and Bonds representing two of the best hitters, not just on the team, but in the entire game. Two great players on good teams, what can go wrong? Well, a lot went wrong because the two stars' egos would clash all the time. The first time something happened was when Kent stole Bond's seat at the front of the team bus and refused to move. When Giants manager Dusty Baker referred to Kent as the team MVP at one point, that really angered Bonds, and in the year 2000, when Jeff Kent ended up winning the MVP award, Kent said this about Bonds afterward, quote, that's Barry. He doesn't answer questions. He palms everybody off on us. So we have to do his talking for him. End quote. Kent literally also went on the record saying, off the field, I don't care about Barry. And Barry doesn't care about me or anybody else. In 2002, the year the Giants made it to the World Series, you'd think everything went smooth sailing with how good they were, but it was anything but. During a game where David Bell had a misplay, Kent screamed at him in the dugout, Bonds came to Bell's defense, and a fight broke out in the Giants' own dugout. Manager Dusty Baker downplayed everything, saying that this stuff usually happens on good teams and that bad teams always get along. I'm not sure that's exactly true, but the Giants seemed to be fine overall after that big friendly fire blow up in the dugout. After the 0-2 season, Kent never played for the Giants again. Not necessarily because of Bonds, I'm sure he just got better money in Houston and eventually LA with the rival Dodgers, but I'm also sure Kent didn't mind no longer being teammates with Barry. For the next teammate beef, we have Yasiel Puig and multiple Dodger players. In 2014, one of the more well-documented incidents between Puig and one of his Dodger teammates took place when Zach Granke stepped off the team bus, took Puig's luggage, and threw it onto Michigan Avenue. An angry Puig then made his way to Granke before being restrained by reliever J.P. Howell. Puig, who was looking for his luggage, had ignored multiple requests to close the luggage bay. He just wouldn't do it. Granke did what he did, and that was that. Well, for that situation, because there were plenty more. Puig was once yelled at by Skip Schumacher for showing up 20 minutes late to the ballpark while also being in a relationship with the daughter of a minor league coach, another thing that was frowned upon. An anonymous Dodger player told MLB insider and reporter Jeff Passan at the time that getting rid of Yasiel Puig would be an addition by subtraction. Puig was taken out in the middle of a game back in 2014 because he threw his bat and sulked after a strikeout. Manager Don Mattingly complained during spring training of 2014 that Puig makes excuses, and on the home opener of the 2014 season at Dodger Stadium, after Puig showed up late to the ballpark, he was benched for the game. I'd say the overall Puig experience for the Dodgers ended up working out just fine, as it resulted in some fun and memorable moments on good teams, but you can't deny he caused a lot of, at least annoyance during his big league days. Let me know what you think, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.